Hello, and welcome to this discussion on the hybrid closed loop in the management of type 1 diabetes. It's a pleasure to uh, address this in the audience in India. I've just came back from a tour and uh, 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 again, fascinated and wish to see you again soon. My name is Oat Cohen and I'm a professor of endocrinology in Shiba Medical Centers in Tel Aviv and also serve as the senior Medical Affairs Director for Medtronic Diabetes. Hello, and welcome to this discussion on the hybrid closed loop system in the management of type 1 diabetes here in the audience in India. Wish I was with you today. I was in India a couple of weeks ago. Fascinated as always, my name is Oat Cohen. I am a professor of endocrinology and internal medicine at the Shiba Medical Center in Tel Aviv and I serve as the senior medical affairs director for Medtronic Diabetes. We'll talk about automation in the therapy of type 1 diabetes, but we of course have to understand why, why is it so important to use technology in the, uh, in, in the treatment of type 1 diabetes? Well, we always discuss on, on uh, Mor mor uh, uh, morbidity and mortality. We talk about complication of type 1 diabetes, but we have to really understand that at the end of the day, it's still a disease, type 1 diabetes, that uh, shortens life. And this is from the Swedish cohort showing that the life expectancy, how many, how many years are lost for those with type 1 diabetes? And this is according to the glycemic control. So the higher A1C, the last years or more years your patient loses if he or she has type 1 diabetes. And if you look at the average A1C of people with type 1 diabetes, we see they're more or less between 7.9, 8.2. So they're around the uh, mortality of 10.14. Uh, we want those with type 1 diabetes to have a normal life close to 3.45 cases of mortality per 1,000 patient a year. So to demonstrate where we want to be and where we are, I have this gap in survivability of those with type 1 diabetes. Now, no place like in India, it is so striking the amount of life years lost because of type 1 diabetes. This is a really recent analysis of the years lost in different areas uh, and regions in the world. I would just want to mention India, you can see how many years are lost between those with diabetes and those without diabetes. So if the life expectancy in India is 63, the life expectancy of people with type 1 diabetes is 24, almost 40 years lost. So things need to be done. But is the situation in India much worse than more uh, 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 countries that spend more on, their, on the treatment of type 1 diabetes? Not really. If you look at the overall control, in, in this case, in the US, you can see that the average people on with diabetes, either they have CGM or not CGM, using technology, not using, is between 9.1 and 8.1. So the question is, how can we move beyond? Why are we have this kind of a ceiling effect that we cannot get better control with those with type 1 diabetes. And the answer is learning from the DPV, from all kinds of uh, cohorts in Europe, that more technology provides for better control. So the question is, where to spend the technology? If you look at the situation right now in India, you can see that the majority of people who do get access to insulin, because there's still issues of access to insulin in India, but those who are treating with insulin injections mostly are using SMBG, even though even SMBG or, or, or blood glucose meter or home blood glucose meters are still uh, a, a, a in demand. It's not, it's not always been covered. But the question is, can we move to a more higher level of technology like sensors or con uh, will that improve much? So that what's the next level of technology? So there was a big move towards, let's start with CGM and see how they use of this technology will change the uh, uh, the outcome of people with type 1 diabetes. And was a, I would say that in the last two years, there's been a huge move. 
many countries have now reimbursed type uh, CGM if it's uh, intermittent or, or real-time CGM, but the results were a bit underwhelming. If you can see the results in the UK, we can see it's just been published that people with the uh, with uh, 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 intermittent scanning decreased a bit the A1C from 8.3 to 7.9. So there was an inc there was an increase in in in, in better outcomes, but still not at the goal that we want the people to be. Only 15% had an A1C of less than 17. The same was in the US, the same in Sweden. So it is not just a, a, a local issue. Sensors, just as sensors, have limited ability to provide the outcomes that we want because they only provide monitoring. This is a classic example from the last couple of years with real life data coming from inter intermittent sc uh, scanning. And we can see that even though that we can see that people who scan a lot get closer to the 7% timing range and, and to an A1C of seven, but the majority of the people, this, those are less than 10% of the people, the majority stay in the range of timing range of 50s and a higher A1C. So why? And the answer is that just monitoring is not the solution because every day you're gonna see different glycemic control. Like in this case over here, a pregnant woman with type one, woman with type one diabetes has a different profile of glucose at two different days. And, they, and she needs a different therapy to meet the specific needs of each of one of the days. Cause if I treat her like day one, but she wakes up, it's like day two, it will be insufficient. And if you treat, more insulin that is which is needed day two, and and a situation which is more resembling type day one, should go to hypoglycemia. So again, it's very difficult to treat all the days that are so different from each other because there's a lot of variability, as we know. This is a very famous picture showing that even those who have the same A1C of around seven might have a lot of variability during the day or less variability, and they need specific uh, uh, solutions to their, thera to, to their glycemia, even though they have the same A1C. So what was the solution? How can technology help? So the first step on technology, and you already know in India, the, uh, the, the Minimed 640 was to have a simple algorithm. Once the blood glucose is predicted to go low, let's stop the infusion of basal insulin and resume it once the trend of glycemia goes up. What does this simple algorithm, the first step of algorithm did, is fantastic. This is from a SMILE study. It's a study on people with high uh, risk of hypoglycemia that used only the suspend uh, before low feature, the 640G, and they were randomized for those who are continuing the regular pump therapy, with, uh, uh, and we compared it to those were using the suspend before low feature. And what happened is clear. Hypoglycemia went away. For those who had a lot of hypoglycemia at baseline and switched to the technology of suspending insulin, hypoglycemia almost disappeared, but, and, but the hyperglycemia stayed. So by suspending basal insulin, when blood glucose goes or in, is intended to go low, can prevent hypoglycemia. But we want to go before that. We also want to optimize the basal rate so it also accommodate for the different demands towards reducing the hyperglycemia. So for this, the first automated insulin delivery system was the 670G that automated the basal rate. What does that mean, automating the basal rate? That means there's no assumption. There is no basal rate because every basal rate every day is different. So no basal rates. Every five minutes, the amount of basal insulin is calculated and given in small dose. It's a different concept. It was very difficult to, to, uh, to uh, uh, persuade the regulators that this can work. And the algorithm is not that complicated the way that it's built, but it has a lot of layers. So the basic ass assumption is that when there is a perturbation, when glucose goes from normal to a bit higher, 
there needs to go into calculations, different aspects of this difference in the glucose. How high it's from the target, how fast did it go up or goes down, and how long is it going in this high, uh, high hyperglycemia. And each one of these components affects the amount of insulin that has been given. And if you put this into equations, the solution for these three equations, which are the what's called the PID, or the proportional integral and derivative aspects of basal insulin secretion, you get a nice solution of insulin that needs to be given when there is a step up of glucose, which really imitates physiology. This it looks very, very similar to the pancreatic uh, first and second phase insulin secretion when it is in, uh, confronted with a hyper or an increase in blood glucose. How does it look in, 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 for, for in, 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 in the clinical work? Well, you can see there's no basal rate, but every five minutes, according to the dynamics of the glycemia in real time, there is a calculation that gives a small bolus. So uh, uh, in order to bring the glucose to the target, in the 670, the target was 120. And indeed, look what happened. By having the algorithm or the mathematics calculate the basal rate, the variability of the glycemia went to the variability of the insulin, or making it even clearer. This was the regular basal rate of an open loop. The basal rate is fixed, and the glucose is all over the place. Once you switch on the automation and the basal rate is now attempting to provide the best solution every five minutes to bring the glucose to the target, you see that the insulin is then is uh, being very variable. Every five minutes is different, but the serum glucose, or in this case, the sensor glucose, it's much more stable. Or the way that the engineers used to Laugh at me and say, okay, this is when you as doctors, the way that you, on the left is the way that you treat the patients. On the right is when it comes to the engineers and we try to fix the glycemia. And they have some, they had some, uh, it was a bit right because look at the results. Just having, automating the basal rate, just the basal rate, increase the timing range from, as you've seen before, in, 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 in usual of around 50 or 40% to 71% and the GMI, or, which is a equivalent to A1C, went to a seven. And this is from real world data of 15,000 patients. So now we can see that we can increase those who reach goals. And remember that goals are related or associated with mortality. So better goals, less mortality from achieving only a third of the use of people with diabetes getting to the goal, just automating the insulin delivery of the basal rate, we increased the amount of people, the percentage of people who reaching goal from 35 to the majority. That means more than 50%. Almost 60% reach the GMI of 7% and 61% have a timing range, which is more than 70%. But still, this is not enough. Why, why, why should we only have 60%? Why can't we go even further? And we did. We did it by having also automated not just the basal rate, but also automating the corrections. How do we do this? So first of all, the correction of the, the automation of the basal rate was very similar to what you've seen before, but the target was now is now reduced to 100. But on top of the auto basal, when there are the conditions of the glucose being more than 120 and the basal rate is unable to reduce it, even though it's at its maximal safe basal, small auto corrections are being given very early on, really imitating the beta cell that doesn't wait for the glucose to be high and then gives a big bolus. Actually, the beta cells, once the Glycemia is over a threshold, it starts giving more and more boluses. And this is exactly how the uh, 780, the Minimate 780 algorithm is trying to imitate nature. So automating basal rate, automating autocorrection. And this corrections of the 
the automatic correction is done in a very smart way. So it's not just a simple a, a calculation of, you know, uh, the present sensor glucose versus uh, the target and then divided by the sensitivity factor. No, it's much more sophisticated because every correction bolus that is going to be given goes through a, sim a mini simulator, which is in the chip, in the pump, that looks ahead for two hours. And if it is simulated that it will cause hypoglycemia, the autocorrection is reduced until it's safe to be given. So there's a lot of layers behind this algorithm uh, that, that governs the, the Minimate 780. From the patient point of view, it's fantastic because the patient has to do less. It doesn't have to calculate a lot of calculations that those who are on, on, on MDI have to do. So their day just looks much better. This is before 780. This is after 780. I don't have to explain much why this is much easier for those with type 1 diabetes to get to better control. How about the results? So we remember, this is the, uh, the consensus of what should be the targets today according to the CGM or the uh, continuous glucose uh, 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 measurements. And, it's, and let's look only on the left. It is recommended that people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, most of them, should be at the timing range of between 70 and 180 to be 70% or above 70% spent time in the normal range and only less than 25 in the hyperglycemia and less than 4% in the target of between 70 and 40, 54 and less than 1% lower than 54. Can automation reach this? And the answer is outstanding yes. And it's the first time that you can really promise somebody who gets a therapy to reach goals. And this again, coming from 25,000 real world uh, uh, users who by using the 780 increased the timing range to 74.3 without increasing the hypoglycemia. And on average on a large population, it's not that 60% reach goal. Now 70% can reach the goal of timing range of more than 70 and a GMI of less than seven and with very low hypoglycemic rates. What's interesting is that this good achievement appears everywhere, not only in the most sophisticated countries or the more uh, uh, rich countries, but all over the world, you can see very similar results, meaning that the algorithm works for everybody, rich, poor, north, south, east, west, as you can see, all of the countries, all having a more than 72, 74% time in range, less than 7% GMI. But I want to show you one, one country in particular, Italy. You can see that Italy has, is very advanced in using technology in type 1 diabetes. And then when they moved from 670, they increased the time in range. And they're F2, from 71, when they went to 780, jumped to 76.7. You can see that the A1C reduced or the GMI was reduced from 7 to 6.8 without increasing the hypoglycemia. And when they had more and more patients enrolled, you can see it's very stable because the algorithm is working. I just wanted to compare to another country who did 75.4% time in range, very low hypoglycemia. And which country is this? This is India. First users, two are, of course, you know, 219 is a, a, a drop in, in the ocean, but it's the first users in India. And you cannot expect that it's going to be different. Why should it be different? Because the algorithm works for everybody all the time, everywhere, providing exactly 75% time in range, low hypoglycemia, and a GMI of 6.8 for the users who are using the 780 in, in India. So, Three things I just want to end and to emphasize. First of all, that this is not a, I would say, a, a short-lived outcome. It's not temporary. If we see on six months follow-up, the outcomes are very stable. It's always nice to see that the results in the real world follow the randomized control study and follow the the in silico uh, modeling of, uh, of virtual patients. So it gives you a lot of confidence in the robustness of the data that I'm just showing you. 
we also showed that using a, a very sophisticated way of looking at the data, that you don't have to bolus a lot to get good results. All you need to bolus is before a meal. This is a still a hybrid closed loop. That means you need to announce that you're eating, but how many times you're eating a day? Three, four times. This is enough. You don't have to do a lot of corrections because the correction is done automatically. Here you can see, not bolusing at all, not bad results, 59% time in range. But this is a hybrid closed loop. So if it's used appropriately, you can get up to 75 or 80% time in range. This is a very complicated slide. What it says is that Settings of the 780G is very important because the optimized settings is using a target of 100 and active insulin time of two hours. Please use this for adults because that will provide for the best results and without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia. And to end in a very positive note, I want to show you how really using optimized setting can affect the outcomes. So if you look at all the users, again, looking at real world data, 12,000 use, users in general reach very nice goals of 75.8% time in range and a GMI of 6.8, low hypoglycemia. If you just look at those who actually do bolus before meals, you already see a slightly increase in the time and range to 76.5 and almost 80% reach the goal. If you look at those who are using the optimal setting of a target of 100 and active insulin time of two hours, then you can see that the timing range increases already to 80% and more than 90% reach the goals. What happens if you take the good from everything and put all of it and use the 780G as intended? That means bolting before meals, using the right targets, look at the numbers. 81.6% time in range with a GMI of 6.5, but look at the numbers. 97% reach a GMI of less than seven. 95, 94.7% reach time in range more than, that means everybody. So you can really see that if you want to be effective and using technology, just don't just put a sensor, put a system. So maybe you're not gonna, save everybody, but everybody who is going to be using this, the system will be saved. And with this optim optimistic note, I would like to end and see if there's any uh, issues, questions that I might help to answer. So thank you very much for joining me today. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.